Good afternoon. Glad you all made it back. I know the restaurants were crowded, but we're thankful that you have returned to worship God once again with us this afternoon. Our children are precious to us. They're dear to us. They are important to us. They are our lives. We are responsible for them. And that means that we must at times show them what we call tough love. We are learning this especially with our youngest. Uh, Sometimes words just don't get through. may have to do a little more. may have to introduce the the rod of correction. And and God tells us that that is certainly uh, part of what parenting is. He tells us that that is necessary unto the proper upbringing of our children, what we call corporal punishment. But we do it out of love. And God does the same for us. We are all His children and from time to time we may stray, we may wander, and we need correction and we need discipline. And the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12 verses 6 and 7, For whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom He receiveth. If ye endure a chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is He whom the Father chasteneth not? We all need it from time to time. That tough love that sets us right that corrects us, that shows us the error of our way, and shows us a better path. God has throughout history had to demonstrate tough love on separate occasions, on different occasions with His people that He loves. And we're going to take a look this afternoon at four of those instances where God had to show tough love. But first I want to share with you an example from my own life where I had to be shown some tough love. And this is my kid's favorite story, I think. You know that my mother was a bus driver for a while, a public school bus driver in rural Mississippi when we were growing up. I've told you about the fights that I would get on the bus. One day, I had gotten in trouble. I don't think I was fighting anyone, but I was probably uh, being relentless towards my sisters. Whatever it was, I had upset her. My mother pulled the bus over on the side of the road, took me out of the bus, made me put my hands on the side of the bus, and wore my behind out for whatever it was. And all I can remember as I was standing there is looking down the edge of the bus and every head on the bus was out the window watching what happened to me. She was a kind and compassionate lady. She only had my best interests at heart, but I had pushed her to the limit on that occasion. I needed her tough love. There was a young man at the congrega- a young man at the congregation where we worked in Jacksonville. He was, uh, I think, he was fifteen. He had just turned fifteen when we got there. Um, young black man. His father was not in the picture very much. His parents were separated. He had numerous siblings, and his mother loves the Lord, and, and they are still faithful. But he was troubled. He had a difficult time. And the first year that we went to Georgia Bible Camp together, he was there, and he had a hard time that week. He was disrespectful. He um, he said some things he should not have said. He did some things that were not appropriate for camp. And he and I had heart-to-heart talks. The elders there were very supportive. They were understanding, and the camp was about an hour and a half away from Jacksonville, but they said, if you have any trouble, you call us, and we will come pick up the child and bring him back home. We were very close to doing that with this young man, this young man. But we had a heart to heart. And after everything he had been through, we talked about some things. And I just remember we were alone down at the ball field. And he just wrapped his arms around me and broke down in tears. Our young people have a hard time. They face difficulties and challenges that we as parents need to be aware of. Today being Father's Day especially, I wanted to to remind you that sometimes we have to show tough love. They need it. They desire it. And God has shown us that that is exactly what is necessary. So four instances where God had to show tough love with us. Yes, that's a funny picture as well. Yes, that might have been me in any day of my youth. Once was in the, in the Garden of Eden. God had to show tough love with Adam and Eve on the, on the occasion of their very first sin. The first sin in the world. Adam and Eve introduced sin and as a result 
It has never and never will depart from this world. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And God has shown us here in His dealing with Adam and Eve that He will punish wrongdoing. These were His children made in His image. He literally formed Adam from the dust of the ground. He, he took a rib from Adam's side and He made Eve from that rib. God loved Adam and Eve. He only gave them one law. It's not like He was an overbearing parent that was punitive and just loved to be harsh toward them. He had only given them one law to observe, but when they broke that law, He had to enforce His punishment. He had to enforce what He had said would happen to them. So we find in Genesis chapter 3, well, beginning in verse 15, the promise of our redemption, the first messianic prediction. I will put enmity, God says, between thee, the, uh, the, the serpent Satan and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Even before he hands out punishment to Adam and Eve, he gives us hope. He tells us that there will be an eternal retribution for this wrongdoing. For Satan being the tempter, there will be victory over sin. But he still has to enforce what he has said. His law, verse 16, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return into the ground. For out of the dust wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. God had to show tough love to Adam and Eve. Now, how easy would it have been for him to say, you're the only people, no one's going to know. It's not a big deal at this point. Sin hasn't gotten out of control. It's just one little sin. But he knew this. He was setting a precedent. He knew that he was perfect. He knew what the rest of time held for every human who would ever live. And so he had to prove here at the outset, at the very beginning with the first sin, that God punishes wrongdoing. He cannot let it slide. He cannot overlook it. He cannot ignore it. He cannot pretend that it's never happened. He will punish wrongdoing. God gives us His grace today. There is now a time that we have. God's long-suffering is extended to us. It's not that He's not fulfilling His promises according to Second Peter 3 verse 9, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But make no doubt about it. God will punish all wrongdoing on the day of judgment. At the end of time when we stand before Him, every sin that we have ever done, if we have not repented and made those things right, if we have not invoked God's forgiveness, the blood of Jesus Christ, He will punish us for our sins. And He has set that precedent here at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden with the first sin. He punished that sin and He will punish every sin. The good news is, through Jesus Christ, through the crushing of Satan's head, His victory over death, all of our sins can be forgotten. They can be washed away. When we are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, those sins are taken off of our record. God forgets them, and He will never bring them up again. They are gone. That is a hope. That is, a, that is our only opportunity to know that those things that we've done will not be held against us. And it is only through God's grace and Jesus' sacrifice that we have that hope. God will punish wrongdoing. That is part of the love that He shows to us because that's what's best for us. That's what we need. That's what will correct us and keep us from those sins again in the future. Adam and Eve had to be cast out of the garden. They had to be removed from that state of perfection. And they never made that mistake again. They didn't have access to that tree anymore. But certainly they understood what they had done wrong. And they knew that God was just for His punishment of them. Tough love means punishing wrongdoing. Fathers, mothers, parents. Yes, we want to show long-suffering with our children. 
But we must also be tough. We must also punish. We must also make sure they understand that there is a consequence for sin. It has to be enforced. Our word must be true. And corporal punishment, as we call it, is appropriate, as we've said. Solomon says in Proverbs 22, verse 15, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. And then Proverbs 23, verse 13, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him, he shall not die. We know that God approves of our use of corporal punishment. It is very similar to the discipline that God had to exercise against His own children throughout times in the Bible. Adam and Eve had to be punished for their sin. All sin will be punished if it is not forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. Next, we want to notice with Moses and his sin that showing tough love means proving authority. It means establishing without a doubt that the one who is enforcing this tough love has authority as a leader. God loved Moses. He had a relationship with Moses unlike anything else that we see in Scripture. They would talk to each other as it were face to face. God showed Moses his hinder parts as he hid him in the cleft of the rock. Moses was the meekest man on earth. He loved God. He loved God's people and he interceded for the people on several occasions when God was ready to start over with Moses, destroy the people and start over with Moses. Moses said, remember your promises, remember your covenant, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Moses sinned. In Numbers chapter 20, Moses struck the rock when he was instructed by God to speak to the rock. The people were thirsty. They needed water. They're wandering in the wilderness. They had already received water from the rock once. And on that occasion, God told Moses to strike the rock. They come to a second occasion where Moses is going to draw water from the rock, but God says you don't have to strike the rock again because the rock typifies Jesus Christ. That rock is Christ, Paul would say in the book of Romans. He didn't have to strike the rock twice. Jesus is only crucified once. This occasion, all Moses had to do was speak to the rock. And the rock would give forth the water that they so desperately needed. But he took upon himself to, to show the people something about himself. It seems that it may have been pride, it may have been frustration that lifted up Moses' heart on this occasion, but as we see here in Numbers chapter 20, beginning in verse 10, Moses and Aaron gathered together the congregation before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock. That sounds like frustration to me. The people murmured and complained. They even thought about throwing, uh, overthrowing Moses and his leadership. But he says, I've been with you all this time. You've murmured and complained, and now we have to bring water out of this rock. And so Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank, and their beasts also. But that was not what God had instructed him to do. Verse 12, The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Moses and Aaron did not believe the Lord. They didn't trust the Lord. They did not think about how God was going to lead them faithfully through this difficulty, even on this occasion. They were just thinking about their own frustration with the people. And so they said, must we fetch you water out of this rock? This was an opportunity for Moses and Aaron in the eyes of the people to show that God loved them, that He cared about them, that all they had to do was ask for the waters of forgiveness, for the life-giving water that they needed. All they had to do was speak to Him. But they took it upon themselves to show their own frustration, to show their authority in this matter, that they could strike this rock and bring water forth whenever they so desired. And as a result, Moses was not allowed to lead this people into the land that he had longed for for 40 years. He had led the people out of Egypt. He had 
led them through the, the wilderness, and now he would not get to see the land of plenty. God would take him up into a mountain and let him view it with his own eyes, but he would die there and God would bury Moses because they had such a wonderful relationship. And I'm not suggesting at all that Moses is not going to be in heaven because of this sin. But God had to punish Moses for his wrongdoing because he did not give God the glory. He did not show God's authority in this occasion as God had asked him to do. When we show tough love, when we use corporal punishment, when we punish the wrongdoing according to the sin, we bring upon the child the appropriate consequence. We prove to that young person that we have the authority that they must respect that comes to us from God and His design for our homes. They need us to show them this kind of tough love to prove, to establish that authority in their minds. That's what God wanted Moses to do on this occasion, but he failed to do so. And so Moses had to be shown tough love. Tough love involves punishing wrongdoing. It involves proving the authority of the one enforcing the discipline. But as we see with the nation of Judah, it also means being patient. Tough love being, means being patient. In Jeremiah chapter 6, God is announcing judgment upon the nation of Judah. It's not Judah individual as a person here. We're talking about the southern nation of Judah. After Israel had been split into two, after the reign of Solomon, the southern nation of Judah was led, was ruled over by the descendants of David, the, the line of David. And through, really, most of the blame is laid at at the feet of Manasseh and the innocent blood that he spilled, because of their idolatry and their faithlessness towards God, he is going to bring the nation of Babylon against them to carry them away into captivity. And their captivity in Babylon for 70 years is going to cure them of this idolatry. But God has demonstrated with them throughout their history a great deal of patience. When we come to this point that Jeremiah is pronouncing God's judgment upon this nation, we must understand how patient God has been with them. Let's first of all read what he says here in Jeremiah chapter 6 beginning in verse 9. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine. Turn back thine hand as a grape gatherer into the baskets. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. And it's not God's fault that these things happened. It wasn't because He was patient that He was just waiting for them to get to this point so He could punish them. His patience and His long-suffering with them should have prevented this from happening. But they refused it. They, they denied God's love and His grace through His long suffering. And they sought their own will, they sought their own pleasure. And so He says, now you're at the point where you cannot hear. There is no other option left for me but to bring this grievous persecution, this grievous bondage upon you. They have no delight in the word of the Lord. Verse 11, Therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days. This is coming. There's no turning it back now. It's too late. They have spurned God's patience. I want you to notice over in chapter 7 what he says beginning in verse 21. Thus says the Lord, of, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, put your burnt offerings under your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spake not unto your fathers nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. There are no commandments to make sacrifices in the Ten Commandments. That's what he's referring to here. Those came later. But this thing commanded I them saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. 
And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. This is the covenant that we entered into. You agreed to it. I will bless you, I will keep you, if you will keep my word, keep my law. Remember that. Verse 24, But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. That's a great way to describe children who are going astray, who are in rebellion, who are consciously trying to provoke their parents. They're going backward. There is a good way. There is a right way. There is a a promotion that they should experience through growth, through learning, through understanding. But rejection and rebellion against the the Word and the will of God is going backwards against what is best for us and not forward. Because he says in verse 25, Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. The nation of Judah had been corrupted. God had sent them prophet after prophet. He had revealed His Word in a loving and kind manner. He had given them warning after warning that this is coming if you don't change, if you don't turn back to Me with all of your heart, you are going to go into captivity. It's coming. Turn around. He was patient. He was long-suffering. But He still had to punish their wrongdoing. At some point, His long-suffering reached its limit. And parents, we need to understand that as well. Our children know how to push us to our limits. They know what our buttons are. And they have learned and can tell when we keep saying, if you do that again, I'm going to punish you. They can tell whether we mean that or not. They learn through experience. There has to come a point where our patience comes to an end, where punishment must follow. So that we do show that we have the authority, but we're only doing this out of love. So showing tough love means punishing wrongdoing. It means proving our authority. It also means being patient, but being firm in our patience as well. But we also notice from the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ that showing tough love can mean permitting persecution. It can mean permitting our children to suffer difficulties because it is what what is best for them. It may mean allowing them to undergo some, some rejection, some failure. And that's not what Jesus went through. We understand that. But from His sacrifice and from God's refusal to intercede on behalf of His only begotten Son, we see that God permitted Him to undergo physical pain and torture because it was what was best for all mankind. Sometimes we have to, for the best, in the best interest of our own children, allow them to undergo some difficulties in life. We're never going to prevent every bad thing from happening to them. They have to learn that they can fail, they can fall, but they can get right back up. That's part of what tough love is. We're never going to prevent uh, every scraped knee, every bruised elbow. We're never going to prevent every tear from falling. Sometimes that is what they need. It's what's best for them. Remember that while Jesus hung there on the cross, He cried out, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? He's quoting, of course, David in the book of Psalms. And I don't believe that he felt that God had forsaken him. I believe that he understood how it might seem that way, but he knew that this was God's will. God, however, we understand how a father might feel as he watches his children deal with difficulty. How he might feel to watch his oldest son, the one in whom he has all his hopes, learn a very difficult life lesson. We have never experienced anything similar to what God felt as He allowed Jesus Christ to hang on that cross. But certainly we know it's not easy to let our children fall, but sometimes it is exactly what they need. It is what is best for them. Now, 
Jesus was suffering as a result of teaching the truth, as a result of being the Son of God, as a result of living a perfect, sinless life. There is a difference between allowing our children to suffer persecution, to suffer ridicule because they're trying to do what's right and trying to intervene and hover over them and prevent every little difficulty or inconvenience in their lives. That's not the situations that we're talking about. We're talking about when our children make a determination in their own life to stand up for what is right, to to say something when no one else will say anything, to actively engage in trying to teach someone else what the Bible says about this life. And they suffer for it. Sometimes we have to let our young people go through that. We have to let our children experience that so they learn for themselves, so that they are affirmed in what they believe and why they believe it. Sometimes we have to show them tough love. But this is in an instance where they're trying to do what's right. They're standing up for what's right and they're persecuted because of it. God loves us and He chastens us. He has given us instruction. Know that He will punish all sin and wrongdoing. He has the authority to do so and He has proved it time and time again. But He is extending His grace to you. He is extending His long-suffering and His patience. Will you not accept His love today? He loves you. He wants to discipline you. He wants to correct your behavior and get you back on the right path. If you're not there this afternoon, you have an opportunity to accept God's tough love. He allowed His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on that cross so that you could be corrected through patient revelation of God's Word. Believe in Him, repent of your sins, confess and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to have those sins taken away. That is corrective discipline in a sense. That is when you submit to the commands, to the will of God. It's not a difficult, it's not a a grievous command to be obeyed, but it is corrective discipline that's being applied to you when you repent, when you change, and when you are obedient to the gospel. If you've done that but you recognize you're no longer concerned about the will of your Father, You're living according to your own will and you are in rebellion against Him. He's waiting lovingly and patiently for you to return. He wants to correct you, but it's not always an easy process. You'll have to repent and confess and we can pray for you. If you have need to respond, why don't you come forward while we stand and sing to encourage you.